right. Well, it's good to see everybody here today. We've got just the right amount of people in here. We don't have to kick anybody up to the other side of the room or the other side of the building, so that's good. See, see, Miss Go Ms. Governor, we're being legal, kind of. Anyway, I read something on the news today that I think is critical to your daily lives. Maybe you haven't seen it. Tanya Harding, do you remember her? The figure skater, the one that hired her, uh, you know, bodyguard to take Nancy Kerrigan at, literally out of the knees, right? She's selling her 1997 Dodge pickup truck for $10,000. <laughs> That's on the news, on a major news channel website. It did. There. Is all right with the world for you now that now that you know that Tanya Harding is trying to make a whole lot of money on an old Dodge truck that's not worth that much? <laughs> it's like, okay. I just thought it was funny, thought I'd share it with you in case you didn't see it. I'm like, really? All right. So, most of us have probably experienced this at some point. We purchase something that requires assembly. Maybe you go to a Portland to the IKEA store because everything there requires assembly, right? You purchase something that requires assembly, and this thing that you purchased was manufactured in, you know, Thailand or China or Japan, you know, somewhere overseas where they speak a different language. And you begin to, well, okay, if you're a woman, you probably read the instructions, right? Guys, we just like look at all the parts and go, oh, we start putting stuff together and see how it turns out, right? But you read the instructions. And some things just don't make any sense, right? What's happening is things are getting lost in translation, right? You know, what their word was translated into the English word, word maybe it's missing a little something. And you're going, like, what? So you got to go look at the pictures. That's why I like instructions with pictures, right? Give me instructions that have, you know, pictures of, you know, or diagrams or drawings of the bolts in exact size and the, and the amount that you have. So I can put them out there, right? And, and different brackets and things like that. So I can put them all out there and then give me uh, clearly drawn instructions so I can just look at the pictures and go, yeah, those pieces go to here. And then I don't have to read step A, B, C, and D. That's helpful, isn't it? So when we're here at the end of John chapter 21, in fact, the, at the end of the book of John, we're going to get to a section where there's, there's a word that gets repeated in here, an English word that gets repeated, and some of the meaning in that word is lost in the translation from the original language, which was Greek. And that word is love. See, in at least American English anyway, love means, the word love means many things, right? Like, I can say, I love my wife. I can say, I love my wife has a little different meaning to it, doesn't it? I can say, I love my parents. I love you guys like brothers and sisters. I can say, I love chocolate. I can say, I love to ride my motorcycle. Or I love to go shooting guns. Or I love to go fishing. Right? Fun stuff, right? Uh, my wife might say, I love to sew. She probably does say that. It all has different meanings to it, doesn't it? But it's the same word. So we have to really understand the context. So here's the word love in John chapter at the end of John chapter 21. In order to really understand what it is that Jesus is saying and that Peter is going to be saying, A, we have to look at context, and B, we've got to go back to that the original language, because in, in the Greek language, there's multiple words for love. Each has a different meaning just within the word. So the two words for love that are going to be used here in the Greek language would be agapeo or agape love. We've probably heard that in church before, right? That's the love of God, right? That sacrificial love that says, I will give my life for you. That's the love Jesus Christ has for you. The other love word used in this passage is phileo. It's like brotherly love, 
Like, I love you because you're my friend, right? We should all be able to say that of each other, right, at least. And so take a moment now and just think, guess, who's using which word? Yeah, Jesus is using that self that self sacrifice love word agape or agape or agape or however you want to pronounce it. Twice he uses that word. Once he uses the phileo word. Peter uses the phileo all the time. So as we read John, uh, John twenty one starting at verse fifteen, what I'm going to do is I am going to insert the definition of the word love being used by the particular person in that particular sentence. Because it enhances the meaning, because it gives us the real meaning of what's being said. So instead of it getting lost in translation, let's put it back in. I know it's maybe not written in your Bible that way, but if you go into the original language and if you were to read it in Greek, it's exactly what it would mean. Beyond just the mere word, the English word love. And I think it's important for us to do that. So let's do that, starting in John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, okay, so let's back up. Remember, they're out fishing. They didn't know what else to do. So a, a bunch of the disciples, led by Peter, like, I'm going fishing. The other one's like, yeah, let's go. We have nothing else to do. Let's go fishing. So they get back in their boats in Galilee, and off they go. And Jesus is hanging out on the shore. He knows they haven't caught anything, right? And they're coming back in probably right at daybreak. And he hollers at them, you know, hey, children, you got any food? You catch any meat, any fish? Right? Nothing. He tells them, remember, remember that? Cast your net on the right side of the boat. You'll find some. And they haul in 153 fish. So they sit down and they have breakfast together. So verse 15 <coughs> says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Okay, I can see this right now. Oh, I don't have Jace here today. I was going to bother him. I was going to bark. I didn't mean bark. I'm not bothering him. Can you imagine, Can you see Jesus walking up to Peter? You know, everybody's, you know, lick their fingers and everything and wipe their hands off on their robes. Can you see Jesus, you know, coming up to Peter, putting his arm around him, maybe kind of up around his neck, right? As In a friendly manner. It's a guy thing, right? Like, come here with me. You see him doing that? I think he did. I was just guessing, but... get the sense that that's what happened. Jesus says to Simon Peter, verse 15, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Let's rephrase that now. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me in the same way that I love you and sacrifice myself for you? Are you willing to give yourself up for me more than these other guys are. That sounds different than just do you love me more than these, doesn't it? He said to him, Peter, responding, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you like a friend. That's that Greek translation for phileo, which is the word that Peter uses here. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you like a friend. Is that the same kind of love that, that Jesus just asked him if he had? No. It's not. And we're going to see that it's going to be okay. He said to him, so Jesus responds to him, end of verse 15, Feed my lambs. Now, obviously, Jesus is not talking about Peter going to, you know, the... Jesus barn and corral and feeding the, you know, the little baby sheep. It's a word picture for people, right? He says to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me enough to lay down your life for me? That agape love. Do you love me enough to walk away from everything for me? Peter responds in the end of verse 16. He says to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you like one of my other brothers here. Hmm. 
Peter isn't really answering the question exactly, is he? He's not stepping up yet to that full sacrificial kind of love. He's still in the, I'm not so sure about all this, Jesus. Keep something in mind. Just a few weeks prior to this, prior to the crucifixion of Jesus, Simon Peter, when Jesus says, I am about to be arrested, I am about to be crucified, and you'll all fall away on account of me, Peter says, oh, not me, Jesus. Peter goes all silverback gorilla, right? Not me. I'll, I'll go. I'll die for you. I'll go to the. I'll go to the cross with you. This is pretty much what he said. Maybe not in those words, but it's what he meant. And what did Jesus tell him? Really? Before the rooster crows. In other words, before sunrise, you will deny me three times. And what did Peter do? Denied it three times. And how do you think Peter felt? We know how Peter felt. It tells us. Right after the third time of the rooster crows, he runs back outside of the courtyard, probably out into the street, and weeps bitterly. So at this point, now we're several weeks later, Peter has seen the risen Jesus. He's now seen him again here. But how does Peter feel, right? in the presence of the one whom he said he would go to the, the grave with, whom he actually said, I have you know, swore that he didn't know this guy. He totally throws Jesus under the bus a few weeks prior, right? He knows that. How does Peter feel? How do you think he's going to feel? About that tall. He's going to feel completely unworthy. I think that's why he can't bring himself up to that level of his declaration of love for Jesus Christ to the level that Jesus is asking of him. I think he thinks he's not worthy. He can't do it. It's no different than Moses, right? Remember Moses. Moses, a Hebrew baby raised by daughter of the, the Egyptian pharaoh, raised in all the education of Egypt and all the wealth and you know all the stuff that goes with it, right? The privilege of being raised as an Egyptian. And at the age of 40, after killing an Egyptian for abusing one of his fellow Jews, one of his fellow Israelites, he flees. He gives up everything. He goes from being uh, number two prince in the kingdom, probably. He goes from being, you know, one, one, of, one of the golden boys to being a shepherd out in the desert somewhere. You can't get much lower than that, can you? That would be like, you know, any of the president's children regardless of who the president is, right? That would be like them going from where they were as kids in the White House to the most dirty, menial job you could think of in the United States, right? Like on the show, what was that, Dirty Jobs? <clears throat> Peter's in the same position Moses was. Moses did not think he firmly believed that once he ran away from that, he was not worthy of anything. And for him, for God to tell him, hey, I have chosen you to go back and to lead my people out. Moses didn't think he could do it. Peter's facing the same thing. Peter's feeling guilty. Sometimes we feel guilty, and it's okay to feel guilty when you know you did something wrong, right? Guilt is not a terrible emotion. But we should not let guilt rule our lives. Because every one of us in here, I would suspect, has had guilt about something. 
The kind of guilt that you just don't want to share with someone else. And so if you were to meet your Savior, Jesus Christ, face to face on the, on the, the lake shore as Peter has, and you have not dealt with that guilt yet, nor have you felt restored, you're going to feel this talk. And if Jesus was to ask you, do you love me? You would say, yeah, I love you, but... But I can't look you in the eye. Yes, I love you, but... Don't ask me to, you know, go be a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or a good news club or, you know, serve in a church because of what I did then. Now, if you have never felt that kind of guilt, you might be a sociopath. And I'm not joking with that. We've all done something at some point in our lives where we go, oh. That's where Peter's at. So when Jesus asks him, do you love me the way I love you? I died for you. Do you love me that way? Peter's only response is, yes, Lord, you know that I love you like a good friend or a brother. And the second time he answers that way, at the end of verse 16, Jesus says, tend my sheep. Remember the first time he says, feed my lambs. This time he says, tend or take care of my sheep. We'll get more to that in a minute. He said to him the third time, verse 17, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? How many times did, did Peter deny Jesus on the early morning, you know, late night, early morning of his arrest? Three, Three times. So Jesus asks him the third time, and I'm pretty sure that's intentional. Not to be mean, right? But I think it's a reminder to Peter to bring that guilt to fruition so that Peter can blurt it out. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? But this time Jesus changes the word love from agape to phileo. So we can read it like this. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me like a brother? Jesus steps it down. Peter was grieved. Because he said to him the third time, Do you love me like a brother? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And guess what? Peter doesn't step up to the agape love. He's still in the brotherly love. So in other words, he could have said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you like my best friend. Like a brother. And you know what? That's okay with Jesus. Because Jesus does not come back and say, well, that's not good enough, Peter. Jesus does not come back and say, you've got to love me exactly the same way I love you or I can't use you. Jesus does not come back and say, Peter, you know what? I give up. I do that sometimes. Like, oh, I'm giving up on that person. Because I don't love people perfectly either. That's not what Jesus says. What Jesus says is this in the end of verse 17 and 18. He says to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Jesus says to Peter, follow me. Beyond just the two love words, 
There's the three commands that Jesus gives to Peter. Even though Peter has not stepped up into that absolute perfect godly love, at least he can't bring himself to say it anyway, Jesus says, feed my lambs. Now the lambs are the young ones, right? The baby sheep. Jesus is telling him, take care of the new Christians. Be a, he's like saying, be an evangelist. Bring them in. Which is exactly what Peter does. We see that in the book of Acts. He eventually gets there. Take care of the baby Christians. Tend my sheep. Take care of those more mature. He is, in, he is instituting Peter into the pastoral role. role. The word for pastor is the same word as shepherd, the same word as minister, one who cares for others. That's what I'm supposed to do. And of course, the third time he says again, feed my sheep. Feed them the word. Part of the pastor's role is not just to be there when you're sick and you're hurting. That happens a lot. Made a lot more difficult with COVID restrictions this year. I haven't been able to make a, a single hospital visit since the first week of March. Yes, it frees up time. But it's pretty hard when you have to go in for a major surgery or something like that. And you have to be alone and nobody can be there with you. Because I'm getting a little off base here, but I count it as a privilege to be there at St. Charles to go into pre-op before they totally knock you out and cart you away and pray with you. I would want someone to do that for me. That's part of tending and the sheep, right? Taking care of the congregation. Preaching is a privilege. That's part of feeding the sheep. Feeding you with God's Word. Opening it up, exposing it to you. Jesus asks Peter three times if he loves him and tells him three times, I want you to do this even though Peter does not yet think he's ready for it. And then Jesus finishes with this. Because remember, Peter said he would die for Jesus. And he will. He did. He says, most assuredly, when you were younger, you girded yourself. In other words, you clothed yourself. You put your own clothes on. That's a big accomplishment when you're a toddler, right? Or maybe a little past toddling age. When you learn to tie your own shoes, right? That's a big deal. <gasps> I learned to tie my shoe. Kind of like when you learn how to use the toilet. That's a big deal. Especially for parents or the kids. Right? When you learn to put your own clothes on. Sorry, Mom, I think you lacked on some of that training. Sometimes I put my shirts on inside out in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Happens, right? Or a brown shoe and a black shoe. Mismatched socks. No, I'm just kidding. Right? So, through most of Peter's life, he has cloaked himself and gone where he wanted to go. And Jesus says... But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you, or another person will dress you, and carry you where you do not wish, sign signifying by the type of death. The, sig the, the, the sign of the spreading of the hands is that sign of crucifixion, and they would have known that. It was part of Roman culture, wasn't it? It was not unusual to have people crucified on the side of the road. Pontius Pilate was famous for it. It's all over extra biblical history about Pontius Pilate. If you were bad, or if he thought you were bad, well, onto the cross you would go. And church tradition, not the Bible, but church tradition has it that Peter was crucified 
upside down, probably at the Colosseum in Rome. And the reason he was crucified upside down is he refused to be crucified right side up as Jesus was. That's church tradition, okay? But he was killed by crucifixion. And I like how Jesus ends, as it ends in verse 19. He doesn't give Peter an out. He doesn't say to Peter, you know what? I get it that your self-esteem is this big right now. So, you know, you just come along when you're ready. Jesus doesn't give Peter time to think about it. Jesus says to Peter, the Peter who denied him, the Peter who can't quite bring himself up to, you know, say Jesus to Jesus, I'm ready. Yes, I love you. I will go wherever you send me and do whatever you tell me to do. That's not the Peter yet, right? Jesus does not give him an out. What he says very emphatically is, follow me. That can mean many things, can't it? But to follow him means you're going to have to go the places Jesus would go and do the things Jesus would do. And where did Jesus go? Who did the Jews accuse him of always you know, hanging out with? With sinners. Right? With drunks and sinners. Jesus is going to hang out with the elites of society. Not very often. When he did, a sinner always appeared, right? And Jesus treated the sinner completely different than the elites of his time. Jesus wanted the people who didn't feel worthy. Peter doesn't feel worthy, and yet Jesus tells him, follow me. Peter can't bring himself to say, I love you, Jesus, and will die for you, because he knew he wouldn't do that, at least up to that point, right? He'd already said that once before, I'll die for you, and it didn't quite, he didn't live up to his own expectation for himself. And Jesus still says, follow me. Jesus doesn't say, you have to be perfectly 100% worthy to follow me. He says, where you are, to Peter, right now, and where you are right now, follow me, follow Jesus, wherever it takes you. I ain't never in my wildest imagination living in eastern Washington, doing what I was doing for a career back then, ever, ever, ever thought or hoped that I would be in Lapine today preaching from God's Word. Because seven or eight years ago, I didn't want to be a preacher, pastor. I was on a church board. I saw what the pastor went through and how some people treated him. I didn't want nothing to do with it. I've been like Monty Python, you know, run away! I kind of tried to do that, and that didn't work either. Just like Peter. Yeah, he wasn't ready, right? Moses, well, oh, God, I can't, I can't go speak to them because, you know, uh, I don't speak very well. Um, I, I, got a, I, I got a speech impediment or something, right? I just don't hurt. Peter's the same way. Uh, yeah, 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 Jesus, I love you. You know, don't, don't smite me. Don't knock me down. And Jesus tells him to follow me. Well, let's see how Peter uh, reacts. We've got a couple more minutes yet. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following. That would be the apostle or disciple John, the author of this book. He never refers to himself by name. 
Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So we know that's John, okay? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, hey, But Lord, what about this man? See what Peter's doing? He's deflecting attention from himself. Jesus has just told him, Feed my leaves, feed, feed my leaves, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. By the way, when you are old, you're going to die like I did and follow me. I think that probably scared Peter. And he's like, hey, what, what about him? Now, we can't really say exactly what Peter was exactly thinking. What was his voice inflection when he said that in, in Greek, right? Was it, well, what about him? Does he, doesn't he get to die like that too? Or is he going to have to go through that? We don't know if he's, he's speaking, this, you know, this question is out of concern for John or out of concern for himself that he's just being singled out. You know, is he, is he the only disciple that's going to be martyred for his faith? Well, it turns out that was not the case. Most of them were. So geez, here's Jesus' answer. If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? Oh, well, let's just stop there. What's Jesus saying to Peter? Don't worry about him, right? I'm speaking to you. And then he says, you... Follow me. And the next little paragraph says, then there was a rumor that basically it started that John wouldn't actually die, which was not the case, right? Jesus was just making a point. See, Jesus is telling Peter, regardless of what you just did four weeks ago, Regardless of who you were as a commercial fisherman on the Sea of Galilee before we met. Regardless of your self-esteem. Regardless of you know, your mental state at the moment. Regardless of your emotions. And regardless of what happens to anyone else, you follow me. That's what we have been called to do, is to follow Jesus Christ, regardless of what people in our family say or think. We've been called to follow Jesus Christ regardless of what our circle of friends or associates thinks. <clears throat> We've been called to follow Jesus Christ regardless of what our co-workers say. Hmm? Or the teammates on our ball team. We've been called to follow Jesus regardless of what our culture, our culture says. There's something weird that just popped into my head. If you put something in a petri dish, a bacteria, and watch it grow under a microscope, what is that stuff in the petri dish actually called? What are you doing with it? Bacteria. But what are you doing with the bacteria? You are culturing it. You're not cultivating it, that's tearing it the ground, right? It is, you are culturing it. Hmm. You are causing something foul and rotten to grow. Is it like uh, Matt's Pizza, right? <laughs> the green stuff underneath the Canadian bacon is a, it's a, cult, it's culturing, right? Yes. It's a giant Italian Petri dish. Ugh. He was telling us a story that it said it's going to be and yet we call, you know, our society, our culture. 
Isn't it kind of rotten right now? Oh man. Boy, does that word have new meaning now, doesn't it? So regardless of all that, we are to follow Jesus Christ. So I want to go back to verse, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. I'm actually putting them here towards the end, okay? It's okay. It says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples. Miracles, right? Just the catch of fish right there, that was a miracle. Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. In fact, John only pulls really about seven of them, okay? Do the book of John, just to let you know. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Jesus is leading Peter to life, to eternal life, and us. And when he says, follow me, that's what he's doing. Remember, Jesus Christ died. Jesus of Nazareth, his human body, died. It did not, he did not go to sleep for three days inside the airless tomb. He died. Yet he rose again. Peter died. His spirit, his soul, is with Jesus Christ now. And someday when Jesus gives the rest of the world a new body, Peter gets one too. of John, the entire Bible from the first words of Genesis to the last words of Revelation are written that we may believe and have life in the name of Jesus Christ. We are called to follow Him. Not wander around aimlessly, right? Not put it off say, hey Jesus, my calendar is full for this month. I will start following you next month. There may not be a next month for you. Jesus says, follow me now. Jesus does not ask for perfection from you. Because you can't generate perfection within yourself. Perfection comes through the Spirit. And even then, I mess it up. I bet you at least one or two of you in here can, can identify with that, right? I'm sure some of you can testify that I mess things up. But we all do. We're all sometimes like Peter. Like, oh, I don't think I'm ready for this one. God, I don't know if I can handle it. Whether you think you can handle it or not, he says, follow me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the book of John. We thank you that he recorded certain specific events in a certain way. So that by hearing it, reading it, absorbing it, we can believe and have life in the name of Jesus Christ. It's Him we preach, crucified, buried, and rose again. In Jesus' name, amen. The music E team, come on back up here for a minute. I think it sounds much better when we blast it through the sound system up here. At least it sounds good here anyway.